congratulations for taking ownership of your financial plan by tuning into the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast hosted by Mason and Associates, financial advisors with over three decades of experience serving you. You will rest easy once your plan is done. You will see clearly just how you have won. Welcome to the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. I'm Michael Mason, Certified Financial Planner. Across the table from me, John Mason, Certified Financial Planner, and Tommy Blackburn, also a Certified Financial Planner and a Certified Public Accountant. Mason and Associates have over three decades of experience helping federal employees with their financial plans. This episode, number 21, Federal Employees Health Health Benefits, FEHB, Medicare, and TRICARE. Basically, all things health insurance, Tommy, uh, for federal employees. Thanks, Mike. What a great intro. Uh, The purpose of today's episode, as Mike just laid out, is to talk about all things FEHB. And really, we just want to hit on like how great of a benefit this is, how how tremendous of a part of the benefits package this is. And also just want to put out there for purposes of today's episode, we're assuming uh, Blue Cross FEHB in Virginia. Uh, there are plenty of other plans out there like GIHA, mail handle, handlers. There's an HSA compatible options. We're choosing the Blue Cross option uh, in Virginia just because that's what most of our clients tend to use and tend to prefer. Oh, if if we went down, Tommy, the various packages or the various options that folks have of various FEHB coverages across the country, we would never be able to finish this podcast. So I, I agree. I think simplifying Blue Cross Blue Shield Standard, Blue Cross Blue Shield Basic, those are overwhelmingly the most popular that our clients have. And although we're kind of fans of that Blue Focus, that newer plan, that hasn't been very highly adopted amongst our clientele. So we're going to focus on basic and standard, I think, throughout this episode. What a great point, John. And the the focus or the HSA compatible option, maybe one of the reasons we don't see it as much is just because our, our clients tend to be more towards retirement. But we do love that HSA option. I think everybody should give it a close look. If you're younger, if you're earlier in your financial plan, you really have a chance to kind of max out that HSA and build that additional bucket. I think one of the things we wanted to talk about today, um, fellas, is particularly for early retirees, which is a lot of federal employees, why is this, why are we so pumped up about FEHB? Why do we think it's such a great benefit? Tommy, federal employee health benefits is, is arguably the second biggest benefit that most of our clients have, right? So most people, when they think about FERS, or they think about CSRS, they think, wow, I have a really good pension. And, you know, caveat that was sometimes first folks don't think they have a very good pension. We'll just say that that both of you, CSRS or FERS, have very lucrative pensions in your own right. Um, Tune into previous episodes if you missed that. But federal employee health benefits, guys, is probably, probably the second biggest benefit that our clients have because the government pays a portion of those premiums and our clients pay a portion of those premiums. And in general, for a Blue Cross Blue Shield standard or basic plan in Virginia, family coverage, Mike, the government's kicking in a thousand or more dollars per month premium share. So like if the total premium is seventeen or eighteen hundred bucks, the government's paying about a thousand or eleven hundred of that, and the federal employees paying five to six hundred. That's like having another three or four hundred thousand dollars in TSP. It's huge. It's huge, and and more importantly, or as important to that, is uh, the ability to retire at fifty-seven, sixty, sixty-two. Uh, we have family members, private sector, uh, that their target date for retirement is age sixty-five because that's when they can get Medicare. I mean, that gap between sixty-two and sixty-five is scary, you know, in the private sector to fill that health insurance issue. Yeah, and what's so interesting is that the cost for our federal retirees as they transition from employment to retirement is that cost stays the same. 
So we don't really see that too much. As, and as we were preparing for this podcast, we were talking about our state uh, retirees, VRS here in Virginia, and they don't get that same benefit when they retire if they keep the state's health insurance, right? Our, our understanding is they're going to pay the entire freight once they retire. No doubt. Yeah. If you retire Virginia retirement system, you go from having very lucrative, very um, comparatively inexpensive health premiums to the day after you retire as maybe a firefighter or law enforcement in your early 50s to all of a sudden waking up to $1,700 to $2,000 a month in health care premiums. I remember a client that I brought on board maybe seven years ago they were on VRS healthcare guys, and it was great when the husband was active firefighter. But then when they when he retired, that premium jumped up to twenty three hundred dollars per month. And one of the instant values that we were able to provide is that next open season, the, the spouse, the wife, went into federal employee health benefits, enrolled in FEHB that next open so season. Windfall for that family. Twenty three hundred down to five or six hundred a month. They were able to bump TSP, Roth IRA contributions, help pay for college, you name it. Um, and and I think that's gonna lead us into some other topics about how we were able to um, use that as a planning strategy as this family got closer to retirement. It's it's huge. So you get to keep the same health insurance. You get to keep the same cost. It makes early retirement uh, very possible, less scary, because we're keeping the, the same plan, same cost. We don't have to go shop a plan. We're going to have very comprehensive coverage. And then we'll have options, of course, once we get towards Medicare. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm thinking about that, I just want to caveat the same cost. It's a, just a small uh, a caveat. You know, When you're working and it comes out, of your pay comes out pre-tax, and in retirement, uh, unless you're law enforcement, uh, it's you're you're going to pay that with after-tax dollars. It's not a huge difference. Well, your tax bracket difference, right? Twenty twenty-two to thirty percent, depending on what your state tax bracket is. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Mike. That was a a point I, I know we wanted to cover. So as I was glancing at my notes, you read my mind of where I was trying to take us. So thanks for um, going ahead and seizing on that. One of the uh, things we think about, too, here, particularly in where we're at now, um, kind of with markets fluctuating and inflation kicking up, as we were preparing for this podcast, thinking about it, thinking about things we talk about with our clients, you know, our FERS retirees got a 4.9% inflation increase, uh, CSRS 5.9, uh, Social Security the same. So those all went up 4.9, 5.9%. Did we see our FEHB premiums increase at that same rate? What do you guys think? I haven't seen I haven't seen that happen. So, uh, in in a previous episode, we talked about uh, the inflation, uh, and don't get uh, too hyper on the inflation because some of your biggest bills, and we didn't mention this one, some of your biggest bills, you know, aren't, aren't affected by uh, twenty twenty two inflation. Your mortgage, uh, your car payment, uh, but. You know, your mortgage might be as low as eleven, twelve hundred bucks a month. You know, in these interest rates, your car payment's not eleven or twelve hundred, but your health insurance premium is. And if it didn't go up by, you know, six percent if you're a CSRS or uh, four point nine if you're FERS, uh, five point nine if you're your military, right? If it didn't go up by that, then there's three of your typical largest bills that weren't affected by inflation. In general, I, I feel like a lot of the media out there talks about how your biggest expenses in retirement are going to be your health care. And that's, that's always something that's kind of like pushed out there. And it creates like this negative thought in our mind that we're going to be very sick one day and we're going to have all these expenses and health care is going to like derail our retirement. And we just don't see that to be the case with federal employees. And, and we're going to talk about throughout the episode how federal employee health benefits and TRICARE coordinate, how these benefits coordinate with Medicare. And, and realistically, what we've seen, Mike, probably in your three decades of doing this and in our um, combined 20 plus years, Tommy, you and me doing it, is that the out-of-pocket expenses for federal employees who are enrolled in Blue Cross Blue Shield and Medicare is your premiums. Now, there may be situations where there's additional out-of-pocket expense, but nine times out of 10, what we see is that you pay your premiums and that's all you pay. You don't typically get bills after a heart attack or after a stroke or after um, any sort of major surgery. It's just your premiums. We've, 
we've talked about this before and we laugh. And uh, if we're laughing at you, just think we're laughing with you. Uh, you know, I've said it around in the Hampton Roads area, you hear advertisements uh, for cars or anything else. And there's always a federal employee discount. There's always a military discount. Uh, and I'm sure these people are, are, are nice and patriotic. But the reality is, is you give discount to the people that have the money. You know, and you want them to come shopping. And why is that a good lead into what I want to say? How many times have we joked about, oh, I'm on a fixed income? You know, it, it's a pretty nice fixed income that got a 6% pay raise, CSRS. Uh, but more importantly, the best health insurance in America, uh, I would rank them this way, guys, and you can fix it. I'd rank military uh, at TRICARE for Life with, with uh, Blue Cross or with Medicare. And then I'd do FEHB in Medicare. And then I'd just do anybody that's on Medicare in a Medicare supplement. Because if you have the right supplement, uh, health insurance or health costs are, are not really hurting you. Absolutely. It's, it's such a tremendous benefit. You just don't see this anywhere else. That's why we also say you're, you're really like a, an executive when you retire. I mean, private sector, it's not common to have this benefit as you go into retirement, let alone such a comprehensive uh, coverage in place. And, and Mike, as you ranked them, one system that popped into my head that's also connected to the federal government um, that actually seems like it's pretty, pretty great is the Federal Reserve. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with it, but we have looked at at least what they pay as an employee, and it's pretty great, um, which is also interesting as we think about inflation and mortgage or uh, just interest rates in general right now. Federal Reserve has some pretty um, nice benefits uh, for their employees as well. I so was also thinking as we discussed this, uh, John, and you're saying the, the media scaring people to death, and, and we're talking about specifically to federal employees, FEHB, TRICARE, Medicare, how great these all are and how they're going to work with your plan. Go back and listen to another recent episode of ours of They're Not Talking to You. And I think that's what we think of and what you'll see and hear throughout all of our episodes, this one in particular, if somebody doesn't know about your FEHB, they don't know how it works, how it's going to work in retirement, how it's going to coordinate with Medicare. If you're on TRICARE and they don't know how all these pieces fit together, this is a tremendous part of your financial plan and a, a big area where mistakes and costly mistakes could be made. A lot of these decisions, whether it be Social Security claiming strategies or Medicare applications, are they can, they're irrevocable, many of them. Or if they're not irrevocable, you have a small window to reverse those decisions. So working with a financial planner or a team of professionals who speaks your language, who understands your benefits, is of utmost importance because there are no do-overs when you get into this, this age bracket. There are no do-overs on missing this tax planning window or activating these benefits. Yeah, John, I had a situation probably 10 years ago uh, with a client, you know, and, and we do a really, really good job here. Uh, and I called her like on her 65th birthday uh, to wish her happy birthday and, and was prepared to help her, you know, transition and apply for Medicare A and, and, and B. And she was retired CSRS and had already dropped her federal employees health benefits in favor of a Medicare supplement. And now, fortunately, I called her for happy birthday and we caught it in time. Uh, but, you know, she's not alone out there. I've talked to people all the time. What do I need to do with this Medicare stuff that you start receiving at 64 and a half, right? Absolutely. So Medicare in general is available at age 65. So if you, if you haven't enrolled by then, about six months, three to six months before you reach age 65, you're going to start getting a lot of information in the mail, as, as Mike just mentioned. And if you're a, a federal retiree, or you're on TRICARE, our general advice here, or maybe let me walk it back, maybe not advice, but our general thoughts are you can just disregard that because you don't need a supplement. Your FEHB is going to act as your supplement or your TRICARE is going to act as your supplement. So as, as we're kind of getting into what happens at Medicare eligibility, what we typically see is you're going to have Part A. So that's going to be your hospital and your inpatient care. And that one is no additional cost. I say no additional cost because we paid Medicare taxes our entire career, so there was a cost to it, but we're paying no additional cost at this point. 
you're also going to have part B. This one is an additional cost. Right now, the the lowest level tier based on your income is $170 a month. And that's for each of you. And part B is going to be your doctors and your hospitals. From there, private sector America, you typically are going to make a lot of sense to get a, a drug policy, a, a part D, as well as some type of supplement to round out your coverages to help pay for co-pays, deductibles, and there's a range of options um, as to how comprehensive of care you want and premiums involved in that. So for our federal and our military, it's usually just A and B, and then whichever of those systems applies to you. I think the big takeaway here, guys, is that if you're you know, federal employees listening to this podcast or federal employees who, who we consult with as clients, is basically at 64 and a half, everything you're going to get in the mail is junk. And, and advantage plans and all these fancy commercials you see with famous actors who are getting up there in age, um, we can pretty much, like Tommy said, just disregard all of that because it's a moot point. And Medicare makes things way too confusing because there's a part A and B, and then there's also supplements A and B, and, and then there's a D thrown in there. It's just And then somehow advantage is C, so we've <laughs> it's very confusing. It's very confusing, and, it, and it's such an uplifting experience to be able to look at a client and say, all that stuff you're getting is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Toss it. Because what we're going to do is we're going to go on Medicare A and B, and then we're going to have federal employee health benefits as your supplement and as your drug plan. And we probably don't have time to talk about why that's so much better, but we'll just throw this out there. Part D drug plans, they change. They change, and they change the rules, and then you have to go find a new drug plan. FEHB doesn't really change. Like It is what it is. You've got what you've got. It is phenomenal coverage. Uh, we do want to warn you. You will automatically enroll in Medicare if you are already receiving Social Security benefits. So if you're receiving um, Social Security retirement benefits, you will automatically enroll at 65 in Medicare, and you will receive a Medicare card in the mail. And it comes on a really flimsy piece of paper. A lot of people laminate it or do something so it feels more permanent and sturdy. We've actually had clients, guys, throw away their Medicare card because they thought it was scam or they thought it was junk mail. They but, thought it, this was like your spare one. We're sending you the real one that will be more durable at a different point. But no, it's similar to the Social Security card. It's just this flimsy piece of paper. Yeah, and if if you're not receiving Social Security and whether you're working or not uh, at age 65, you must enroll. You should enroll in Medicare Part A. It's free. You don't want to to miss that age 65 limit. Uh, if you're currently working as a federal employee, you don't necessarily have to apply for Medicare Part B at that time, but you s still need to put your foot in the door and apply for A. So, Mike, I think to your point, uh, you're referencing that initial enrollment period. And, and most people have probably heard of this, but the initial enrollment period is a seven-month window. So three months before your birthday of 65, the month of your birthday and three months after. So that seven month window is the IEP or the initial enrollment period where most people become first eligible for Medicare. And, and oftentimes our federal employees are retired by then and will be enrolling during that initial enrollment period. But we also have something called a special enrollment period, which is what you alluded to if one was still working past age 65. Right, so that special enrollment period is gonna last for six months. And what that says is you can delay enrolling in Medicare, A and B, supplements, et cetera, and not be penalized. If you go past age 65, if you qualify, if you have qualifying group health coverage through your employer that you're working, um, that you're working for currently. So it's very important we, we meet those strict requirements to take advantage of this rule. And we do see folks take advantage of it, but we also see some, some folks make mistakes where I think they're covered under an old, maybe they're covered under a retirement plan and they're not covered under their current group, um, group coverage. And they think that, hey, I've got, I've got qualifying coverage. Well, it's not by your current employer, so you don't meet it. But if you do meet it, you can delay past age 65. Once that coverage ceases, you retire, you've got six months. And if we miss these, the reason we're talking about these windows is, is fellas, what happens? It's a 10% premium penalty for every year that you didn't enroll. 
and for, that, the, for life for life and that's a lifetime annual 10 percent you know butt whooping we'll call it call it what it is an increase in your premium that never goes away and and that's if you miss your initial enrollment your special enrollment and you had to have missed one of these i believe 12 months i think before that penalty I believe you're correct. You have to go a full 12 months. So it is possible if you missed it, you may be able to try to pick it up at the open enrollment before you go the full 12 months. But that's never a situation you want to intentionally put yourself in. And going back to your example, Tommy, when you talked about group coverage and people misunderstanding um, that rule about delaying past age 65 and waiting for that special enrollment period, it's kind of confusing because federal employee health benefits is group coverage and it's qualifying group coverage if you're working, but it's not qualifying group coverage if you're retired. So retired employees, federal employees at 64 and nine months, you're enrolling because you don't meet that criteria, but an active federal employee, that person does meet meet the qualifications of qualifying group health care. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. I, I think that hopefully drove that point home. So we've been talking about Medicare a and B, and we like coupling it with FEHB. Perhaps we can talk about what we see, at least for our, our employees here, um, what FEHB combination we tend to go with, and also take a look at what does um, maybe Tricare situation look like. Yeah, Tommy, that's uh, that's a great point. Uh, before we get you know up to our elbows in that one, let's uh, make sure that you can have FEHB in retirement. Uh, so you have the five-year rule. Uh, so the rule says you must have had federal employees' health insurance uh, for the five years leading up to retirement to keep it in retirement. Uh, but many people mess this rule up. Uh, if you had TRICARE, uh, retired military, and then went federal, if you've had TRICARE uh, and chose not to have FEHB, uh, you can still enroll in FH, F, F, FEHB and have it into retirement if you're covered under a spouse's federal employee's health benefits, uh, it's like you have in it. Uh, even if you're both federal employees, right, it's like you have in it, and then you probably want to go self-self at retirement at some point. Uh, so understand understanding that rule. And then I guess one other thing, and we'll probably one other thing our, our, ourselves to death here, but uh, uh, as FEHB retirees, uh, you don't have to enroll in Medicare if you don't want to. You know, you can, if you're healthy and you've loved your FEHB coverage all the way up to 64, you know, years, 11 months and 30 days, and you've been able to handle the deductibles and whatnot, uh, you could currently, husband, wife, save $340 by not enrolling in Medicare Part B. You should still take A, you know, but we've had many uh, retirees opt to just keep the same health insurance and save $340 a month. That's $4,000 a year. That's pretty good savings. It's it's a scary recommendation. It's one that, that we're not scared to make at the appropriate time, but it is scary. And typically in that scenario, we would have $200,000, $300,000 of guaranteed income, really big required minimum distributions. We would find ourselves in a position, Mike, where that IRMA, that income-related monthly adjustment amount is significant. So instead of paying 170 for Medicare, these folks maybe were paying 300, 400, 500 a month in addition to their FEHB premium. So that's where the decision becomes pretty easy if you're impacted by IRMA. Nine times out of 10, if you're in that lowest tier of Medicare, 170, we're most of the time recommending a combo. But to your point, you made it 30, 40 years as a federal employee without two coverages. We think you could probably do the same in retirement, although that's not, not typically what we recommend. And then two points, and then back to Tommy, because he's, um, he asked very good questions about how, how we combine or what combination are we typically using. I've never had in 11 years anybody complain to me saying, John, I really wish I didn't have two health insurance. I really wish I didn't have Medicare and FEHB. That complaint has never happened. I can imagine a world where somebody says, I really, really wish I would have enrolled in Part B at 65. So the flip side is similar to survivor benefits. Most of the time we don't have people come in and say, I'm so upset that I took survivor benefits. 
that's most of the time like a three to six month adjustment period when they retire, if any. But what do we see? Six months after retirement, terminally ill, I wish I would have taken SBP. So I think this is one of those scenarios as well. One other point, one more thing, like you said, one other point is the five-year rule, Tommy, does not mean you have to be in the same plan for five years. Right. I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation or confusion around this five, five-year rule. So hopefully that helps clear, clear that up. I thought it was great, Mike, when you said think about self plus self and brings us back to a point of really what you both were talking about of don't get complacent um, with the plans we have in place. Like, let's see, maybe self and family made sense at one point and now self plus one or if we have two federal employees, it's, it's self and self. So want to look at our options, realize each um, open season you know, we can make changes to this. We can go from a higher, the standard plan to the basic or, or back. So you're not necessarily locked into that decision. It's just an annual one. Um, some other ones we wanted to talk about as we kind of, as I visually think about transitioning to retirement as a federal employee with FEHB is we, we hit on TRICARE. That satisfies the five-year rules. And sometimes they want to enroll in that FEHB just to keep the option open. But there's another special thing about our TRICARE uh, federal retirees um, that's not available to others. Yeah, and Tommy, you know, what, what I was thinking as you were going down that path, many of our, our dual retirees, military and then uh, federal, uh, sometimes TRICARE is just enough for them. And they're they just stay, you know, have that. But then as they're approaching retirement, they meet us. We're like, how about you just sign up for one year FEHB uh, so you have it as a backup? And what do we mean as a backup? Uh, once you're 65 and, and on Medicare A and B and you've got TRICARE for life, uh, you definitely don't need FEHB, although we've seen that, you know, and, and we should avoid that. Uh, but you're able to suspend FEHB. Uh, when you have TRICARE for life uh, and you suspend it and you just keep it on the back shelf uh, because there may be a time uh, where, and I won't go down the scenarios, but there may be a time where you want to pull it off the shelf because uh, you never know what the future holds. So suspending F- FEHB is is a, a good option. It's a really nice flexibility tool to be aware of. And, and I think it brings us back to as John was talking about Irma. That's one of those situations where maybe that person on Medicare and TRICARE for Life may decide, hey, this has gotten to a point that these premiums, you know, I'm reconsidering this and FEHB is looking like a good option. It could be a scenario. An- another one, if we will, if you guys wanted to talk about it is, for, for folks, we have the deferred versus the postponed retirement and whether, you know, who's eligible for FEHB later. So, Tommy, I think it's a great point, and, and we don't see a ton of this, but occasionally there will be the federal employee who, sat, who has five or more years of federal service and leaves or separates before they've attained minimum retirement age, so like 57 years old. And in that scenario, they have a deferred, right? Deferred? Yes, deferred. So as we were talking about uh, preparing for this podcast, we the lingo that's used sometimes is even a little difficult for us to keep it straight who deal with it all the time. So I think postponed is the you met MRA at minimum retirement age and you could have taken a pension, but you decided not to, to avoid the early penalty. So that's, I believe, postponed. And deferred is you were not eligible to start the pension yet. And the biggest, the biggest difference between those two is so deferred, you, had, you were vested, you had years of service, but when you left, you couldn't physically activate a pension at all. It wasn't even an option. So in that scenario, you're now waiting for 60 or 62 to activate that pension. And in this scenario, when you leave, your FEHB is gone forever, never to be seen again, can never be reactivated. You lost it. So we really need to think, like, are we leaving our federal job at 54 years old to never have federal employee health benefits ever again? Probably not. Versus the postponed says, we'll see this typically, guys, in like a military retiree more often, somebody who went to the federal government after military service, had an MRA, 57 or older, and 10 years of service. In that scenario, they had an option, to Tommy's point, of an immediately electing an annuity at retirement, 
although it'll be reduced or penalized for retiring early, you had an option. So in that scenario, you could have done it, maintained your FEHB, you're all good. Exactly. Or you postpone, right? And if you postpone to 62, you go into a blackout period where you have no federal health benefits until such time that that pension's activated. Whew. And then once you've activated your pension, bam, FEHB comes back into the fold. All I can say is if they're not talking to you, hopefully that <laughs> scenario right there just drove home knowing, uh, working with folks who, who know you and your benefits and all the different nuances that can present themselves. So I think we've... <coughs> yeah, Tommy, I was just thinking we've, we've covered a lot and I think maybe it'd be helpful for our audience to maybe break down a couple age groups and just talk about like how we see this working for retirees. So let's talk real quick about somebody who's retiring at 57, what health insurance do they have from 57 to 64? Then what happens at 65? And we'll do our two main categories, somebody with federal employee health benefits only and somebody who has FEHB and maybe TRICARE um, out there as well. So, so let's talk a little bit maybe first about that 57 to 64. What are we typically seeing in that federal employee health benefit scenario? Great. This is going to be some great scenarios to go through. So for that 57 to approaching 65 age, that Medicare age, for FEHB only, for our federal FEHB only situation, they're going to keep that FEHB coverage. Now they may each open season look at, do you want basic standard? You know, what type of options do you want? But you want to keep that FEHB coverage that you've known and you've loved throughout your entire career for our military federal. So we have TRICARE plus FEHB in that scenario, uh, retiring 57 before Medicare, we're typically going to see suspend FEHB and just have TRICARE leading up to Medicare. However, you may have your reasons as to why you want FEHB. Perhaps um, you're not, that's what satisfies you. You could keep FEHB and TRICARE, that combination, and then again, make some decisions once you get to age 65. Perfect. And for those thinking about well, how do I suspend federal employee health benefits? What's the process? Well, we've seen this time and time again. Unfortunately, human resources and retirement counselors don't know this form. It's the RI 79-9. And on page two of that, there's a little checkbox that says, I am suspending federal employee health benefits in favor of TRICARE, TRICARE for Life and Medicare, and you have to submit proof that you're enrolled in those coverages. So if you are interested in suspending FEHB, no, it's not irrevocable because you can enroll the next open season. And the RI 79-9 is your form to use to suspend. Um, and then just one important note on that too, if you're enrolling in FEHB, the open season before retirement, you have to make sure you actually physically have coverage for a little bit before you retire. Meaning if you're enrolling November of 22, you probably can't retire until February of 23. That way you had that coverage guys, at least for, for a few days before you submitted that retirement app. Maybe, maybe you can't suspend until February, right? You said you can't retire until February. So you could, uh, well, you can't retire. You can't retire because you never had it and you, you suspend at retirement, right? I see your point. I see your point. That's why we're so good. You know, one, <laughs> other, one other thing I would add uh, to this 57 through age 64 uh, is even if all you have is FEHB and you have no other choice you know, to carry it, just make sure, and we've said this earlier in the podcast, make sure if you both have an option to carry FEHB that you're carrying it in the cheapest format that you can, uh, and that would be self-self. If somehow or another you're that age and you're still having family members, and you could be 57 and still have a, a 24, 25-year-old child, uh, well, then the cheapest is probably family coverage. You know? So just make sure that you, have those, that you cover all your bases. Transitioning to that age 65 Medicare window, again, we're in that federal employee health benefits only scenario. Again, we're often recommending Medicare Part A and B. Um, again, we're assuming you're retired enrolling during your initial enrollment period into Medicare A and B for a couple of reasons. One, you virtually have no out-of-pocket expenses once you have these two coverages um, in combination or in tandem. Secondly, 
and the scenario guys, we would almost always recommend rolling back from Blue Cross Blue Shield standard to Blue Cross Blue Shield basic. That saves our clients 200 to $250 a month in premium. It's very rare that we've ever seen that additional premium be worth it once you have those two coverages. So there may be compelling reasons, 57 to 64, to have the Cadillac coverage. At 65, we're not seeing that unless it's like a prescription drug scenario where, where maybe that you know, tier five or whatever is not covered like it would be um, basic and standard. So again, enrolling in Medicare A and B is the recommendation. Consider rolling back from the Cadillac Blue Cross Blue Shield to just the normal car. I was going to say you're rolling back from like the Cadillac limited, you know, extraordinary edition to just the base Cadillac because they're both still great policies. Right. We didn't, we're not in a different class of vehicle. We're just in a different <laughs> trim at that point. Exactly. And then, and one other reason to enroll in that lower trim coverage is that makes you eligible for a Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicare reimbursement of $800 per person. So $1,600 rebate, guys, if you are 65 and enrolled in Blue Cross Blue Shield Basic and Medicare Part B, effectively, Blue Cross is paying 39% of your family's Medicare premiums, um, thanking you for being enrolled in both coverages. So that's what we're seeing on a FEHB only both pre and post 65. And for a society that, you know, sees things like this, okay, you're going to take my standard coverage to basic and charge me $200 a month less, and then you're going to give me $800. You know, we've been ingrained to believe that uh, if you hear something like that, it's a scam. Uh, so let me just explain why it's that way. Blue Cross Blue Shield wants to keep your business, and they realize that when you have Medicare A and B, uh, paying for standard is not in your best interest. They don't want to lose your business. They don't want you doing the math at some point. They don't want Giha or one of these other companies coming to you and say, why are you spending that much? You can spend less with us and we'll send a rebate to you. Uh, so they want you to be in basic. Uh, they can't lower the cost of basic for everybody because everybody's not on Medicare. So they lower it. They don't lower the premium. They give you the rebate. So it's real. Uh, and it's an incentive because they want to keep your business. So now, Mike, if you would, we're 57 to 64. We covered the FEHB and TRICARE combination. What do we typically see now at 65 for somebody that has two coverages and possibly now we're entering the realm of having three coverages at 65, a TRICARE, a Medicare, and a federal employee health benefit? Yeah, and, and sometimes when we see this, John... Uh, it's legitimate. You should have all three. You know, I've seen it uh, with a client where uh, the husband's retired military and he's 65, is on TRICARE for life, uh, but his wife is 62 and she doesn't have FEHB. She doesn't have health insurance in any other fashion. Uh, and uh, that this couple had a daughter that was still on the plan. So they had to have the three, you know, so we don't want to say having three is bad all the time. Uh, but once both of you uh, can be on that TRICARE for life and Medicare A and B, uh, you definitely are getting no extra benefit by spending $400 a month or more uh, for FEHB. So that would be a, a time to suspend it. So typically in that scenario, suspending federal employee health benefits in favor of TRICARE for life and Medicare A and B, also noting that, that it's TRICARE for life is contingent on your enrollment in both of these Medicare coverages, which we know is is a point of contention for a lot of military retirees across the country. But yes, TRICARE for Life is contingent on your Medicare A and B enrollment. And guys, we've danced around this topic. I just want to say it out loud for, for the audience and for us. Nothing in this podcast can be taken as advice because you just had a great point, Mike, where you were like, well, there's a, a disabled child or there's a family member or there's a young kid or there, somebody was adopted. And it's like, well, now that's a game changer. That's an entire game changer. We have a kid in college and TRICARE young adult is more expensive than being on an FEHB family plan or what have you. So I just want to say this is all general advice. You can't take it as 
as actionable advice from from this podcast, but hopefully it's getting our listeners their mind thinking in the right direction of what opportunities do I have and how do I maximize that coverage. So what do you think, guys? We, we now turn to some action items because the goal of this podcast is not only to educate, but to hopefully motivate and get our federal employees to, to take action. So let's go around the table, however many times we have on specific actions or takeaways that we hope our listeners gain from today's show. Yeah, I would, uh, as a senior citizen here, I would uh, ask that uh, once you're over 60, uh, that you don't get complacent in this. Don't just say, I've always had Blue Cross Blue Shield standard. I'm always going to have it. Uh, assess it. And if, if you don't feel comfortable or don't want to do the work uh, to assess, then seek out professional help. Uh, the decisions you make are only uh, solid for one year. You can always go back and change them. Uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, federal employees have that option of not having Medicare A and B. Uh, maybe you get it when you're 65 and retired, and maybe you get to 72 to 75 and your required mandatory distributions are so high, it's making your premiums for Medicare so high. So you, you just can't sit back on your laurels and say, this is what I've been doing. You should assess it every year. Great, Mike. And as I think about it, it, it brings us back to have a plan, have a tax plan, have a financial plan so that you can begin to map out all these possible scenarios and kind of see a course of action. And really, as I think about it, all of the great information we've covered, it's if you're going to get advice, uh, which probably is very warranted as we think about the complexities here, make sure it's somebody who specializes in your situation or is going to do the homework to really understand your situation. So go back and listen to that episode we did about they're not talking to you. If you're going to get advice on this, they should be talking to you and understand the intricacies of how FEHB and potentially TRICARE along with Medicare, uh, along with all the tax ramifications and, and various decisions all come together for you. If you're a federal employee and you're not currently ro enrolled in FEHB, why? You may have a very compelling reason. Your spouse has better coverage through Virginia Retirement System or some other public institution. But at some point, we need to make that switch and we need to understand that FEHB in retirement is probably better than that alternative coverage in retirement. And we need to make sure we satisfy that five-year rule. And if you haven't heard this, FEHB coverage passes to a surviving spouse, but only if you died with a family plan or a self plus one plan. So if you're not enrolled in healthcare and you pass away while active, there's no survivor health insurance to your spouse in that scenario. So we need to be thinking about if we're not already in that coverage, when do we enroll in that coverage and, and make sure we satisfy that five-year clock? Wonderful, wonderful point to note. Yeah, I would, I would add something that you, you worked the active angle, uh, so let's work the retired angle. Maybe you did all the right things for FEHB. You know, you retired, uh, but you made, and, and you and your spouse are enjoying the FEHB coverage, but you made the wrong decision on survivor benefits, and you die. Uh, you die without leaving a survivor benefit. Now, all of a sudden, your spouse is not in federal employees' health benefits. So, so bad decisions can be made uh, right after good ones. Yeah, just to bring us back to the beginning, we talked about how wonderful of a benefit this is, how this is another three or $400,000 of an asset to you uh, to generate this FEHB uh, plan that you have. So have that survivor plan in place. Make sure that we're, we're thinking about the various scenarios. I think that's great. We spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time talking uh, to the people that we usually serve, uh, which is 59 and a half and older. Uh, I would say that, and I don't see the, the, the mid-career, the 35 to, to 55, uh, but you shouldn't just go into the standard Blue Cross Blue Shield you know, uh, plan and not look at the, the HSA plans. And you guys you know, in that group can probably talk a little bit more intelligently about why you shouldn't just go into that highest premium plan uh, versus an HSA. Wonderful action points. And, and guys, I think I'll leave it with this, with our audience. Um, some final actions here. We'd love to hear from you. We appreciate the five-star ratings. Um, if you haven't already, please leave us a, a five-star rating. We'd love to hear from you, whether it be on our Facebook page, our LinkedIn page, or a direct email to masonfp 
at masonllc.net. Future topics, questions, we can address those on future episodes. Again, this is episode 21. So we'd love to hear from you. We appreciate the reviews, questions, comments, Facebook, LinkedIn, or masonfp at masonllc.net. Thank you for your support. We hope you're enjoying this podcast and we'll see you soon. You will rest easy once your plan's done. You will see clearly just how you have won. The topics discussed on this podcast represent our best understanding of federal benefits and are for informational and educational purposes only and should not be construed as investment, financial planning, or other professional advice. We encourage you to consult with the Office of Personnel Management and one or more professional advisors before taking any action based on the information presented.